It looks by itself, as it did in 1932, an essentially stupid, non-human building, its architecture concerned merely with height and with bravado. It has now, on the 3rd of June, 2467, the same number of stories, 102, that it had then. But now, they are all empty, even of the furniture of offices. It is 1,250 feet tall, nearly a quarter of a mile, and there is no use for it now. It is only a marker, a mute testimony to the human ability to make things that are too big. The context over which it stands has come to magnify it more than the New York of the 20th century ever could. There are no other tall buildings in New York. It truly towers above Manhattan in singleness of form and intent in the way that it must have sprung to the hopeful minds of its architects. New York is nearly a grave. The Empire State Building is its gravestone. Mockingbird by Walter Tevis, 1980. You may recognize the name Walter Tevis. Perhaps you've read or watched adaptations of The Man Who Fell to Earth. Or perhaps you've seen the movies The Hustler or The Color of Money, based on his novels. One of the most popular adaptations was his novel about chess, The Queen's Gambit, on Netflix. This novel, Mockingbird, has been optioned for a film. On April 20th, 2022, it was announced that Alma Harrell will direct a film adaptation of the book for Searchlight Pictures. Mockingbird is a future dystopia, a world where people are drugged and have lost the ability to do many things for themselves, including reading. The world's population has cratered, and there have been no children for the last 30 years. The novel is told from the point of view of three characters. The first one that we meet is Spoforth. He is a robot, but it's a robot whose intelligence comes from a human. They've wiped out much of the individualism of the human, but allowed that which makes a human conscious to exist in this robot. We discover that Spoforth is the last of his kind. He has lived now for 170 years. He is a robot searching for meaning, searching for a glimpse of that humanity that his intellect was based on, a conscious being without the ability to end his own life. He is the caretaker for New York and directs many robots in the repairs of the infrastructure. Our next character is Bentley. Bentley has learned to read and has identified himself to Spoforth. He moves to New York. Spoforth has him learn to read further and to translate silent films. Spoforth is looking for humanity in the moving pictures. Bentley slowly discovers that there is more to this world. As he reads, he learns what they've lost. He learns how this drugged society has lost its meaning. There are some horrific scenes where people, drugged out of their minds, choose to leave by immolation, burning themselves. Bentley starts to question the drugs that they are given, and he also discovers and starts to form a relationship with a female character, our third protagonist. Mary Lou. Mary Lou has been resisting the drugs and has been finding a way to rebel against the robots. She lives in the zoo. Bentley and Mary Lou form a relationship. They live together. This is something that's illegal. And eventually, Spoforth stops it. He removes Mary Lou and sends Bentley to prison. That's as far as I want to go with the plot. Let me give you a sense, though, of what is coming up. We explore further this dystopia. We meet different communities and ways of living. We wonder if this is it for humanity. Will we die out and just a few robots left to survive as long as they can work? Why are we dying out? What have the drugs to do with this? 
So we have our tin man, Spoforth, looking for a heart, looking for a soul. We have Bentley, our guide, in some ways standing in for us as a character in this world. And we have Mary Lou, a woman who will not bend to this society. What has Spoforth planned for Mary Lou? Will Bentley and Mary Lou be reunited? There are a number of revelations in this novel in the last 75 pages or so. Tevis has a gentle, lyrical quality to his writing. I enjoyed living in this world, and I could see some of the revelations coming. In fact, there are things that you will be hoping for as you approach the end of the novel. It is a beautiful meditation on what makes us human. The name of the novel, Mockingbird, comes from Bentley's reading. Only the mockingbird sings at the edge of the woods. At a couple of points, I started to wonder if one of the books that Bentley read was To Kill a Mockingbird. But I think Tevis was writing a love letter to reading a mockingbird singing at the edge of the forest. The act of reading, bringing back humanity. This is the second Tevis novel that I've read. Earlier in this channel's history, you can find a review for The Man Who Fell to Earth. In it, I tell you a little bit about Walter Tevis himself. Obviously, his work has had great success with a number of adaptations. If you want to read a beautiful dystopic novel before it becomes famous in film, I think you should pick this one up. I give Mockingbird 8 out of 10. And the dawn begins, low over Brooklyn spreading to Upper Manhattan, over Harlem and White Plains and what was once Columbia University, a gray light over land where Indians had slept on filthy skins and where, later, white men had focused their fretful intensity of power and money and yearning, pushing up buildings in hubris, in mad cockiness, filling streets with taxis and anxious people, and finally dying into drugs and inwardness.